Hi, I'm Anthony Fisher with Reason TV, and I'm speaking with Al Press, the author of the book Beautiful Souls, Saying No, Breaking Ranks, and Heeding the Voice of Conscience in Dark Times. It tells the story of a few ordinary people who risk their careers, reputations, and sometimes their lives to break with the majority and do the right thing. Can you talk about where the title Beautiful Souls comes from? Sure. Beautiful Souls is actually a Hebrew expression. Um, it's Yafei Nefesh, and it sounds... Um, as I fear the title at first glance sounds a little hokey and a little sort of honey-coated. Um, oh, everyone would surely want to be called a beautiful soul. Um, in fact, it is a term of derision in Israel. It's sort of a, a synonym for bleeding heart. And the soldier I write about comes to a, has a crisis of conscience in which he fears that he's being viewed as a beautiful soul, as though this is something negative. Most of the beautiful souls depicted in the book don't get a Hollywood ending. They're not celebrated for doing the right thing and often they lose everything. It's kind of a dismal final analysis and not a great advertisement for bravery. What do you think motivates people to maintain their individual righteousness at any cost? Any honest depiction of that is not going to be, in a sense, uh, the Hollywood version of the story where the person who um, defies these things is thanked for it. Again, getting back to the title, the reason I chose that title is because I want to bring across to readers um, that uh, these are people we have a very easy time idealizing when they're very far away from us, when they say no to other unjust laws, the ones that we don't ourselves comply with. But when um, people who resist or question or don't conform are closer to us when we find them in the same workplace we're in or in the same neighborhood we're in or in the same country we're in, um, then it becomes much harder to, um, you know, to admire them. They tend to be scorned and vilified. There's a sequence of stories in the book. And in the first story, you're in the context of World War II, where I think as, for Americans, uh, people are so familiar here with uh, you know, just following orders. They think of Germans. We all think of Germans and how could they have followed orders. In fact, we all follow orders most of the time in our lives. We all adapt, fit in, conform. The last story in the book is about a financial broker who works at a firm where everyone around her is conforming and adapting to the management directives, which is to sell a fraudulent financial product. And, and one broker there, the one I profile, Layla Weidler, uh, doesn't do that. Um, but we shouldn't um, just think that, oh, this is, this is something that Germans or Japanese or Rwandans do. It's a huge force in, 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 in every modern society. The Milgram experiment is used as an example several times in the book of how ordinary people can be compelled to do evil things um, when they feel like they're complying with authority. Can you briefly explain the Milgram experiment and how it applies to the subject of your book? Sure. Um, I actually think the Milgram experiment has been misunderstood, and I try to convey that in the book. Uh, Stanley Milgram brought ordinary Americans into a laboratory. One person in the experiment was the learner, the other person was the teacher, and the teacher was told every time the learner answered a question wrong to shock the person, to go one voltage up on a mock shock machine. The learner getting these shocks was an actor. So this was actually a test of conformity. What Milgram expected was that very few people would continue shocking the person uh, to very high voltage until the learner passed out and, and screamed. Two thirds of the subjects in the experiment went all the way. And this was just startling to everyone. And it has led people to think, well, human beings are mindless conformists. They just go along, or maybe they're sadists worse, right? They, they just, they get these orders. They don't care uh, that they're just uh, mindlessly doing this. If you read the actual transcripts of what transpired in the labs or read Stanley Milgram's own excellent book about his experiment, what he says and what the transcripts show is that most people didn't want to go along and indeed they resisted. But there were prompts that Milgram used to get them to go further and those prompts were very successful. And one of the most successful ones was to tell the person, you are not responsible for the suffering of this person. I'm responsible. I run the experiment. Don't worry about it. And Milgram, in a sense, captured this thing we all do, which is we shift the responsibility for our actions to some, someone above us in the chain of command, maybe someone below us in the chain of command, or maybe just, you know, oh, this is the way the world is, and in that way reconcile doing things that we actually think are wrong. That, to me, is the genius of the experiment. It's a dark message, but it's not as hopeless a message as I think people, people who know very little about it think. Thanks so much, Al Press, author of Beautiful Souls. For Reason TV, I'm Anthony Fisher.